I'm surprised you're introducing me, taking so long to introduce me. I've been here before and I'm so happy to be back. Thank you, Jeremy, for the opportunity to come and celebrate this wonderful day with you. And uh, thank you for, I'm so happy to see Pastor Loretta singing in the choir as well today. That was so wonderful. <laughs> As bishop, I have the privilege of bringing you greetings from your sister churches throughout Singapore. You have 44 sister Methodist churches in Singapore, and of course churches throughout the world uh, celebrate this wonderful day. Particularly, I've noticed uh, from one of our sister churches, a number of you have come to help also bring greetings. I see a number of Barker Road people here, including my wife who worships at Barker Road, and she's here, and my daughter is here, and we bring you greetings. So thank you so much for this opportunity to celebrate with you. Today is Christmas. And earlier uh, we were asked, the song leader asked us to think about what is the meaning of Christmas? What would your answer be? What is the Bible's answer? What is Christmas all about? The Bible actually tells us and gives us different ways of understanding uh, the meaning of Christmas because there's so much meaning and, and prof profound uh, significance for our lives. This morning, let me just reflect on one passage of Scripture that I think talks about the meaning and the significance of Christmas. Matthew chapter 1. In verses 21 to, 20, to 23, Matthew records the birth of Jesus and then reflects on what this birth of Jesus means. And so here are the verses, Matthew 1, 21 to 23. Let's listen to the Word of God. And since we have modern technology that puts words up on the screen, let's join our voices together and read Holy Scripture. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the word of the Lord. A boy was trying to get to know a girl. My name is Bobby. Please tell me what is your name. The girl replied, I don't want to tell you. Why not? I'm sure you have a beautiful name. No, you'll laugh. I promise I won't laugh. What is your name? I'm named after my father and mother. That's nice. What are their names? My dad is Ferdinand and my mother is Eliza. Good. So what is your name? They named me Fertilizer. Our Bible passage this morning also uses two names to describe the one child, the Christmas child. The names Jesus and the name Emmanuel. And I think these two names give us two good reasons why we should celebrate Christmas. Two answers to the question, what is the meaning of Christmas? Firstly, the name Jesus. Matthew tells us that the Christ child is named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, the name Jesus is derived from the Hebrew word, the very Hebrew, a very common Hebrew name, Yeshua, and it means salvation. Firstly, then, the Bible writer invites us to celebrate Christmas because the birth of this child named Jesus is a promise of God, a promise of salvation from sin. Now, no one likes to talk about sin, especially not in a happy Christmas season service. But the Bible actually presents salvation from sin as something very good, as good news. Something, in fact, that we should all want to hear about, not just on Christmas Day, but every day. Surely most human beings would agree that we want and that we need salvation from the sins in this world that are destroying us. We live in a world where parents can get drunk and beat their own children. We live in a world where even babies can be abandoned in rubbish dumps. 
We live in a world of wars and bombs where children and parents and grandparents are killed. This is what the Bible describes as the effects of human sin. If you don't like the word, call it something else. Evil, human immorality, human failing. But whatever we call it, surely we all know that sin exists. Sin destroys even our homes, our families, our friendships. Sin produces civil wars and chaos and hatred. Sin destroys peace. Sin destroys happiness on earth. Surely we agree our world needs and our world wants to be saved from these sins that are destroying us. And this is why the promise of Christmas is good news for everybody. It is joy to the world, not just joy for Christians. The child born at Christmas is named Jesus, a promise that the world will be saved from the sins that are destroying us. And who amongst us doesn't need, who amongst us wouldn't want this hope and promise of salvation to come true? And so we celebrate Christmas because it offers us God's promise that one day we and our world will be saved from our sins which are destroying us. The Christmas child is given also a second name, a second reason that Christmas is good news. The child of Christmas is not only called Jesus, which means salvation, he's also called Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God is with us. Christmas reminds us that there is a God who promises to always be with us. God is born in the form of a human child to live on earth, to suffer life on earth. A God who is with us in living and suffering and in dying on earth. This is the good news of Christmas. Emmanuel, God is with us. But you might wonder, in what way is God being with us good news? Let me offer an answer by way of two examples. The first example is a trivial one. It comes from my school days over 40 years ago. In those days, there were not so many rules regarding what a teacher could or could not do to punish students. And our teachers had their own creative ways of punishing us naughty boys when we were disruptive in class. One of our teachers liked to discipline us by making us do push-ups. So a few of us agreed on a plan. When one of us was punished and told to do 20 push-ups, three or four of us would also get out of our seats and do 20 push-ups along with him, joining in the punishment, and the rest of the class would start laughing when this happened. Another teacher would punish us by shaming us, making us stand on a chair. And so when one of us was shamed in this way, few of us would also stand up on our chairs voluntarily to stand with him. And this somehow made the shame and the punishment less shameful, less painful for everyone. My apologies to teachers. I do not tell this anecdote to encourage our students to be cheeky and rebellious. I cite this illustration as an illustration of how the company of someone else suffering with you, being shamed together with you, makes it a little easier to cope with the shame and the suffering. It, it doesn't remove the suffering, but it helps us go through it and endure it a little better because we do not suffer alone. Why is God's promise of being with us so powerful? Here is a second example, and it isn't at all trivial. Clevis Shima now runs a restaurant that's just downstairs from where I live. Life was desperate, he says, remembering how his beloved mother died from cancer when he was only 14 years old and how he and his brother had to resort to stealing bread just to stay alive. The 1995 civil war in Albania forced many people 
to try and escape from the violence that was uh, enveloping the country. And the first escape of these two young brothers was unsuccessful. It involved dark and dangerous hours in a small speedboat that was crammed with 45 desperate people also trying to escape. They were chased by a police boat. They were tossed around by the waves. The boat almost capsized. The, the attempt was not successful. The second attempt to escape was successful, but he and his brother found themselves now living homeless on the cold streets and in train stations in Italy until one day Italian police caught them and sent them, and put them into shelters for homeless kids. You can find more details of his harrowing experiences as a child. They're captured in his testimony published by Salt and Light. I was struck by what he said about those dark and dangerous days. And he said this, he felt this, even though he did not really yet know Christ, nor belong to any church. He wrote, God was there at every step that I took. All the people who helped me were sent by God. I was never alone, no matter how difficult life was. God had always been there for me. Christmas reminds us that there is a God who is there for us, no matter how difficult life is. Emmanuel, God who suffers with us on earth. Is there anything worse than suffering? I think there is. Worse than suffering is suffering all alone. When we suffer and nobody seems to see or care or understand our pain, that is worse. Christmas assures us that we do not suffer alone. Jesus is with us. Jesus suffers with us. The name Emmanuel is a promise that God is with us in our suffering. God suffers with us the frustrations and the despair and the unfairness of living on earth. This is the Christmas promise, the Christmas good news. Jesus promises us that when we are suffering, we are not suffering alone. Jesus being with us does not magically remove the suffering that we are experiencing on earth, but it helps us to believe that we are not suffering alone. It gives us courage and strength to endure the suffering a little bit better. God suffers with us. There is an old song that I think relates to Christmas. Many of us, anyway, it often is played on the radios during Christmas time. And I think it does summarize this hope that we have of salvation, the salvation promise from God. This song was popularized by Johnny Mathis in the late 1970s, When a Child is Born. Jeremy claims he, he doesn't know the song, you know, late 1970s, but uh, Uncle George, I'm sure you know this song. A ray of hope flickers in the sky. A tiny star lights up way up high. Those of us who are older, you want to sing, sing along, you can join me. All across the land, Dawn's a brand new morn. This comes to pass when a child is born. So Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy, you've got lots of congregations who were born in the 70s or earlier. <laughs> Listen to the words spoken near the end of this song. Surely they express the desires and the hopes of all of our hearts. The world is waiting waiting for one child, black, white, yellow, no one knows, but a child that will grow up and turn tears to laughter, turn hate to love, war to peace, turn everyone to everyone's neighbour, and misery and suffering will be words to be forgotten forever. Don't we all dream that this will come true one day? Don't we all want to see tears turn to laughter, hatred to love, war to peace? Don't we all want salvation from wars, misery and suffering? 
Christmas celebrates God's promise that such salvation will take place, that such desires, such hopes for peace from the sins and salvation from the sins of war, salvation from the hatred that is on earth, that salvation will take place. It will come true. This is the peace and salvation which the Jesus of Christmas promises and wants for everybody. The same song goes on to admit, it's all a dream, an illusion now. It feels as if this wonderful Christmas promise is just an illusion, just a pipe dream. We have not been saved from our sins. Sin is still wreaking havoc and destructive wars in our world and in our society and our families. But surely the fact that we have not yet been fully saved is all the more reason why we must continue to celebrate the hope of Christmas, the promise of Christmas, that one day our world will be saved. We mustn't give up hoping, for if we do, then we might give up fighting against the sin and the evil that is within us and that is destroying us. Christmas inspires us to keep fighting the good fight, to keep believing in the triumph of love over hate, in the triumph of peace over war, the triumph of salvation over destruction. And so we must continue to encourage one another to embrace the wonderful promise of Christmas. Just as the song urges us to hold on to this hope and belief, even though it's all a dream, an illusion now, it must come true sometime soon, somehow. All across the land dawns a brand new morn. This comes to pass when a child is born. Christians believe that this will come to pass. This will come true sometime soon, somehow, because the Christmas child is born. The Christ child, whose name is Jesus. God's promise of salvation, a salvation that we all so badly need. And in the meantime, whilst it's still just a dream, an illusion now, while suffering and evil continues to afflict us all, we can find strength in believing that we are not suffering alone. For Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. There is a second Christmas song that urges us to keep holding on, keep celebrating the Christmas promise. Henry Longfellow was becoming cynical. Cynical about believing in the promise of Christmas. It was one of the darkest periods in American history. Civil war between the North and the South was killing hundreds of young lives, tearing apart, destroying many families every day. And during those dark period, that dark period, Longfellow wrote a poem. And here's his first verse. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But this happy sounding message of peace on earth, goodwill to men, this Christmas message, this happy sounding Christmas message was overshadowed by the overwhelming darkness that was gripping the whole country. And these familiar words of Christmas seem so naive, so useless to Henry. And so Henry Longfellow's second verse read, But in despair I bowed my head, There is no peace on earth, I said, For hate is strong and mocks the song, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Today we also celebrate Christmas in a very dark period of human history. 
COVID-19 still darkens our world. And now many lives also are being lost in the bombs and the battles between Hamas and Israel, between Russia and Ukraine. There are still floods and fires that take lives. There's still child abuse and exploitation. The list of tragedies are ongoing still in our world, still mocking the Christmas song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in the midst of such darkness, it is hard, isn't it? It is hard to go on believing in Christmas promises. It is hard not to bow down in despair and discouragement. Hard not to become cynical and mock the Christmas promise of peace on earth, goodwill amongst humankind. But hard as it is, we mustn't give up believing. Friends, giving up doesn't help. Becoming cynical will not save us. A Scottish preacher was plunged into the darkness of despair when his beloved wife was suddenly taken away from him. But despite his pain, and he did not give up believing in God. Here's what he said in an emotional sermon he gave soon after his wife's sudden death. He admitted that he did not understand why God had taken away his wife. He did not understand why this earthly life was so full of suffering. But even more, he said he could not understand why anyone would choose to abandon faith in God's promises of love and life eternal. Quote, abandon the faith? Abandon it for what? People in the sunshine may believe the faith, but we in the shadow must believe it. We have nothing else. Unquote. The English professor G.K. Chesterton argued a similar thing. When belief in God becomes difficult because of suffering, there is a tendency for some to turn away from God. But in heaven's name, turn away to what? How does turning away from the good news of Christ help us in our darkness? The light from the Christmas candles may seem to be very small and insignificant in the face of the world's overwhelming darkness. But how does turning away from the light, from the little candle and from the promise of God, how does turning away help? Turning away from God's promises will not bring our loved ones back to life. Turning away from God will not make the wars come to an end. So why turn away? Turn away from God to what? To cynicism, to bitterness, to despair and anger and loneliness. The horrors of war almost pushed Henry Longfellow to turn away from God into despair. But he didn't. And in a final verse to his Christmas carol, he reaffirmed his hope and faith in the promise of Christmas. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men, Jesus means salvation. Emmanuel means God is with us. May the Christmas promise that Jesus will save our world from its sins and the promise that God is with us in all our present suffering. May this Christmas promise be born anew in each of our hearts as we face the unknown future in 2024. Amen. Let me invite you to take a few moments in quiet prayer. Would you pray for someone you know who is feeling all alone in his or her suffering? Maybe it is your parent 
or sibling or child or a colleague at work struggling with sickness. Pray for someone you know who feels so alone in the midst of that suffering and pain. Pray that the wonderful hope of Christmas may come true for them, that they will know God as Emmanuel with them in their pain. Or we might think of people we don't know but who are suffering in this world because of war and other disasters. This Christmas, may they come to know something of the presence of God with them in their darkness. And Father, if there is anything that we can say or do which might help our friends or people in the world who are suffering so much, if there's anything we can do to help them perhaps sense that they are not alone, that you are with them, that can help encourage them to hold on in hope for the salvation that you promise. Father, help us to do that in our own little way. Your Son, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Emmanuel, God with us. Please come and save us. Save our world from our sins. And stay by our side. Be God with us through all our suffering and pain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Christmas isn't really Christmas till it happens in our hearts, somewhere deep inside. Father, please, somewhere deep inside us, renew the faith. Renew, give us hope again to keep believing in the good news of Christmas, in your promise that salvation, we will be saved from our sins. Grant us faith and strength to believe that you are with us. We thank you for this hour of celebration as we go forth back into a world that is still in so much darkness. May we bring your promise, your good news, that you are with us. May hope be revived in all of our hearts, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.